Good morning and welcome to worship on this More Light Sunday, the Sunday when we celebrate the inclusion of all of God's children as part of our worship, of our being, of our church family. You can see the progress pride flag behind me. Uh, This is just to give you a little sneak peek of that. It will soon be going up outside of our church building. If you have your worship packets with you. Please join with me in the gathering words. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, day to day and night to night. Unending is their silent speech of beauty and wonder. How shall we join their joyful witness with words that proclaim God's inclusive love, with works that bring forth God's powerful justice, with worship that rejoices in God's wondrous presence, now and always. Let us pray. God of our salvation, the world is on fire. Rather than trust or vulnerability, fear and anxiety have become our ways of being. Our schools are not safe. Our homes are not safe. Our places of worship are not safe. We grasp for any lifeline that will pull us from this pit, but find only tattered threads. We are lost in the desert of our own undoing. We do not trust ourselves or others to perform any benevolent act, no matter how small. The world is on fire. Move us from this place of scarcity. Give us the vision to see your abundance, even in the midst of such destruction. Remind us, O God, that you are within and beyond the smoke. Where we haven't the words, come, Spirit, come. Amen.
There are a few prayers to share this morning. An update that Jim P. is doing much better this week. The COVID test was negative and the antibiotics have knocked out the fever and other symptoms. Another update from Dan and Laura. Grandson Aaron's x-rays show the growth of new bone in his wrist. Only three more weeks until his cast comes off. From Peggy S., we have prayers asked for Peter, husband of Maury K. He had outpatient surgery, went septic, and is in the ICU. There is some improvement, but he's still unconscious. They're trying to wean him off the ventilator, but so far have not been successful. Our prayers are with them. Don D. will be going for an additional surgery on his wrist this Wednesday. And from Nora M., prayers of thanks. This week, Rufus and family participated in a Zoom ceremony with SefQ for a scholarship that he got from them. They're looking forward to great futures at the University of Buffalo. Congratulations, Rufus. And for birthdays this week, today is Nora M's birthday. So happy birthday, Nora. And if you see her on Friday, Linda O has a birthday this week as well. At this time, I'll turn it over to Margaret Stoner, who would like to tell you a little bit more about the More Light movement. Hello, friends. I've been asked to share some history of our becoming a more light church and some stories of the Shower of Stoles. Chanley Gill of our congregation attended the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA in 1990, that's already 30 years ago, and came back to preach a sermon on inclusiveness, a whole new concept to most of us. This was inclusiveness of LGBT folks, that is, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folks. We were awakened about LGBT people, easily family and friends among us, hiding in closets, unable to be who they were among us. The next year, the General Assembly produced reports on human sexuality that we studied. So the Church and Community and Society Committee offered study opportunities to the congregation and thus began a very intense first decade toward our becoming more light. That is, joining the More Light Presbyterians organization, which we did in 1997. Folks out for, outside First United became very important to our growth, including the Reverend Dr. Janie Spar from Rochester, who was and still is an evangelist in seeking God's wisdom for allowing all to serve. The denomination was struggling with the question of ordaining Presbyterian LGBT folks to the offices of deacon, elder, and pastor. Janie, a very warm-hearted lesbian, helped us work through this idea, resulting in our developing an inclusive statement, always in the Sunday bulletins in brief form, to be circulated through the congregation. We organized an all-congregation conversation through the I'm sorry, through 13 small groups meeting in home, homes, home visits, phone calls, written responses, receiving input from 166 people. Isn't that amazing? 166 people regarding the proposed statement of inclusivity. In 1997, we joined More Light Presbyterians, making public our commitment to inclusivity hung a five by eight rainbow banner outside the church, and in January 1998, hung 15 stoles from the Shower of Stoles project on Ordination Sunday. In this same year, although not approved by the denomination, the session 
acted to support United, First United Clergy in officiating, officiating at Holy Unions, a commitment ceremony for two people of the same gender with each other. First United was very active at the Presbytery level, participated in the efforts to bring about a broader welcome at the General Assembly level, and joined other denominational churches to lobby with New York State legislators for marriage e equality. In years since, ordination of LGBT members became possible in the denomination, and marriage equality was approved both in the denomination and in New York State. We are aware that, sadly, this openness is not operational in all of the denominations. Our rainbow banner has billowed through it all, announcing our welcome to everyone. As our world changes, we welcome all, keeping keeps our welcome all keeps growing to really welcome everyone, and we do celebrate this. You see the pictures of the stoles being projected this morning. The Shower of Stoles project is a national and now international project of quote, over 1,000 stoles representing the lives of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people of faith. This extraordinary collection celebrates the gifts of LGBT persons who serve God in countless ways, while also lifting up those who have been excluded from service because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. The collection bears witness to the huge loss of leadership that the wider church has brought upon itself because of its own unjust policies. I would lift, like to lift up two events where the Shower of Stoles played a major role in our life as a more light church. In 1998, as we celebrated the first anniversary of becoming a more light church, we had the whole exhibit at that time, 400 stoles displayed. It was a party hanging all those stoles to be displayed on wires and coat racks. Without tape and pins was the challenge. It was also sobering when we stopped to read the stories on the stoles. The sanctuary was magnificent. We were surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, each with a story, some anonymous, still closeted, all very important. We caught the poignancy of the moment. This was Pentecost, and the Reverend Janie Spar was with us again, bringing inspiration and deeper understandings of what it means to both receive and witness to God's deep, deep love for each and all of us. I want to include here that the exhibit included stoles previously given in honor of Marcia Mintz Botsford and Shirley Hinkamp for their leadership and work for LGBT justice before coming to Troy and First United. We thank you, Marcia, out there, and Shirley, who was recently deceased. The second event was on November 16, 2008. This was, a, was the dedication of two styles, stoles planned and crafted in consultation with the Morelite Ministries team by Trudy Wyburn's daughter, Renee Croner Hoagland, a professional quilter. One was dedicated to the Reverend Elizabeth Hall, former pastor here from 1985 to 91. Pastor Betsy challenged us by her words and deeds to seek justice and live justly. Her joy in ministry, coupled with her ability to raise thought-provoking questions and ideas, grew us as a congregation and helped prepare us for the decade of becoming more light. The creator, Rene, writes that the stole named the Pink Triangle is based on the Nazi annihilation of not just Jews, but other groups, including homosexuals who were forced to wear pink triangles as identification. The Holocaust Triangle on dark background reminds us that LGBT members of our society are still discriminated against, even those called to serve God. Perhaps uncomfortable to look at, the stole forces us to address our prejudices. This comes from the Dedication Stoles booklet. 
the stole was given to the shower of Stoll's project for exhibition. The second stole honors and remembers the work and integrity of J uh, Todd Wilson, son of Aline, and young man on the session. Todd came out to his family, then the session, and the congregation at age 23. Quote, Todd had a great sense of humor, a wonderful smile, and was confident that the PCUSA would see the light. He never questioned that our efforts to bring about justice in the church for lesbian and gay folks was not worth it. Todd had faith in the just thing, injustice. Written by Martha Younger in the dedication booklet. The stole for Todd is beautiful cascades of colors as you can see here. Um, cascades of colors as the waters of baptism with fish at the bottom challenging us to be fishers of people and a descending dove as the spirit of God. The stole is kept here at First United and often displayed or worn by the pastor. Todd passed away in 2005 from lung cancer. We have had and continue to have a vibrant work in justice and community building. May God bring grace upon us and lead us to share God's extravagant love. That's from Janie Spar. Extravagant love and acceptance for all of us as God's people. Thank you. Let us pray. As the body is clothed in cloth and the muscles in the skin and the bones in the muscles and the heart in the chest, so are we, body and soul, clothed in the goodness of Christ. Yet too often we turn away from this goodness that is in our very being, trusting in God's faithfulness, compassion, and constant presence within and among us. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. Creating God, you knit our bodies, black bodies, brown bodies, white bodies, bodies created in love and meant to be loved. Our trans bodies, queer bodies, cisgender bodies, straight bodies. Our bodies were created in love and meant to be loved. And yet, we have upheld these lies. Black bodies are deficient. Brown bodies are illegal. White bodies are superior. Trans bon bodies are fundamentally flawed. Queer bodies are over-sexualized. Only cisgender bodies are natural. Only straight bodies are normal. We have borne these lies from our thoughts, passed them on to our children, sputtered them from our mouths, spat them at our neighbors. We have turned them in upon ourselves and out against one another. Like poison, they consume us, so that the truth that we are your beloved children is lost. Forgive us, O oh God, for believing these lies, for internalizing them and for upholding systems that reinforce them. Forgive us for forgetting this truth, that our bodies were created in love and that we are your beloved children. Beloveds, we have been created in love and to be compassionate with our own bodies and one another's. Do not let the sin of deception convince you that you are anything less. Live as people who have died and have been brought back to life, trusting that the God of resurrection is the same God who lifts up each and every day, holding us individually and collectively. Amen.
This morning we have Dan Rogers giving our scripture reading. Today's scripture is the story of creation from the book of Genesis, beginning with chapter 1, verse 1, and continuing through chapter 2, verse 4a. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth became chaos and emptiness, and darkness came over the face of the deep. Yet the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Light be, and light was. God saw that light was good, and God separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness night. Evening came, and morning followed, the first day. Then God said, Now, make an expanse between the waters. Separate water from water. So it was. God made the expanse and separated the water above the expanse and the water below it. God called the expanse sky. Evening came and morning followed, the second day. Then God said, Waters under the sky be gathered into one place. Dry ground appear. So it was. God called the dry ground earth and the gathering of the waters sea. And God saw that this was good. Then God said, Earth produce vegetation, plants that scatter their own seeds, and every kind of fruit tree that bears fruit from its own seed in it. So it was. The earth brought forth every kind of plant that bears seed and every kind of fruit tree on earth that bears fruit with its seed in it. And God saw that this was good. Evening came and morning followed the third day. Then God said, Now let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. Separate day from night. Let them mark the signs and seasons days and years, and serve as luminaries in the sky, shedding light on the earth. So it was. God made the two great lights, the greater one to illumine the day, and the lesser one to illumine the night. Then God made the stars as well, placing them in the expanse of the sky to shed light on the earth, to govern both day and night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that this was good. Evening came, and morning followed, the fourth day. Then God said, Waters swarm with an abundance of living beings. Birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the sky. And so it was. God created great sea monsters and all sorts of swimming creatures with which the waters are filled, and all kinds of birds. God saw that this was good and blessed them, saying, Bear fruit, increase your numbers, and fill the waters of the seas. Birds abound on the earth. Er evening came, and morning followed, the fifth day. Then God said, Earth, bring forth all kinds of living souls, cattle, things that crawl, and wild animals of all kinds. So it was. God made all kinds of wild animals and cattle and everything that crawls on the ground, and God saw that this was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image to be like us. Let them be stewards of the fish in the sea, the birds of the air, the cattle, the wild animals and everything that crawls on the ground. Humankind was created as God's reflection in the divine image God created them. Female and male, God made them. God blessed them and said, Bear fruit, increase your numbers, and fill the earth and be responsible for it. Watch over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and all the living things on the earth. 
God then told them, Look, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree whose fruit carries its seed inside itself. They will be your food. And to all the animals of the earth and the birds of the air and things that crawl on the ground, everything that has living soul in it, I give all the green plants for food. So it was. God looked at all of this creation and proclaimed that this was good, very good. Evening came and morning followed, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth and all their array were completed. On the seventh day, God had finished all the work of creation. And so on that seventh day, God rested. God blessed the seventh day and called it sacred because on it, God rested from all the work of creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Let us pray. Speak to us today, O God, not what I would have to say, but what you would have each of us to hear. Amen. So last week, we celebrated Pentecost, reading about the birth of the Christian church in the book of Acts. And the birth of the church began in chaos as the Holy Spirit gave the apostles the ability to speak in the various languages of the people who were gathered around them. Now, if you think about it, most birth stories contain at least some amount of chaos. When my niece Katie was born, our entire family had all planned to assemble at the hospital around six o'clock in the morning to welcome her into the world following her planned c-section and so i drove all the way to pennsylvania from maine to be there for it we got all ready to go had everything set for the next morning katie however had other ideas arriving just after midnight on the night before her planned birthday. This prompted a rushed trip to the hospital, many sleepless hours, a bunch of phone calls, and one cranky toddler who had just become a big sister. Talk about chaotic. The book of Genesis also contains the story of a birth from chaos. However, unlike the chaos surrounding Katie's birth, in Genesis we read about the chaos of nothingness. It was an abyss, an emptiness out of which God created order. At least that's the story around which our belief system is based. As we know, there are many different stories of how the earth and who, human life and, and everything else came into existence. The ancient Babylonians believed that their god Marduk created all things by tearing apart the god of chaos. Today, the co common scientific understanding is that everything came into being when chaos was transformed following a Big Bang. Chaos, it seems, is the one common factor in each of these stories of origin. But where the Big Bang theory and the Babylonian creation story both begin with violence, our origin story begins with a word. Our God, Yahweh, spoke creation into being. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible, were written while Israel was in exile in Babylon. 
Surrounded by the riotous nature of the Babylonian people, Jewish scribes wrote down this creation story of Genesis in protest of the violence that surrounded them. They needed a way to remind themselves that God had created humanity as an act of love, that their existence wasn't the result of some great big accident. So they recorded the story of God lovingly crafting each piece of the, nar- of the universe. The land and the sea, the plants, the animals, and finally, humanity. Now, it doesn't matter if we believe that the formation of the universe took seven days or 15 billion years. The how of the creation story is so much less important than the why. Historically, how a group of people understands and tells their story of origin dictates how they treat everything around them. The Babylonians believed that the earth came about through violence, and that is how they treated the earth and all of its inhabitants, as something to be used and discarded. If we believe that the earth is here purely by accident and that we ourselves are accidents, then we've essentially stripped life of its meaning. But if we look at creation as something that was spoken into being, as something that was created and declared by God to be good, then we see life as a miracle. Unfortunately, we don't always respond to our origin story as if all life is a miracle. At times, Christians have claimed a special privilege as the offspring of God's chosen people of Israel and followers of God's only begotten, Jesus Christ. They've used that claim as a license to take over and destroy other cultures, other peoples. The first Europeans to arrive in the Americas claimed that smallpox was God's way of delivering America to them from the hands of native people. White Christians have historically used this assertion of dominion as an excuse to enslave black people, to kill six million Jews in the Holocaust, to designate people of color and LGBT folks and anyone else who didn't look and act and think just like them as separate and certainly not equal. But the first chapter of Genesis tells a different story, one in which God is the creator of all things, where God created and declared all of those creations good. And when we begin to look at our origin story this way, when we truly see God as the one who created every bit of what is the sun, the moon, the earth and sky, the water, the air, the animals, and every single human being, then we come to realize that this earth wasn't just made for one group of people. Creation, all that is, wasn't just made for the desires of the Christians. It wasn't just made for the pilgrims either, or the Americans, or the rich. All of creation was made by God for all people to enjoy equally. We are special. We are special 
not because of what we believe or of where we live or how we were born. We are special because we are human beings. In the first creation account, humans are the culmination of six days of work. In the second account, in Genesis chapter 2, we are the guests of honor, the head of the parade. In both accounts, humans, we are created in the image of God. And in bearing God's image, we have a responsibility to watch over the created order, to care for all of creation rather than exploiting it. And you know, this is where translations matter. Because a lot of Bible translations that you read, when you read Genesis 1, they'll say that God gave humans dominion over the earth. And we have misused and and misinterpreted that word dominion to the detriment of the entire world. Dominion doesn't mean the freedom to use and misuse. Dominion means to have responsibility for the care of something. Instead, we walk around like we own the place, acting out of some sort of sense of entitlement rather than responsibility. We are called by God to have dominion over the earth, not domination. We are called to do unto creation as God has done unto us, treating all humans with respect and dignity, regardless of race, age, gender, social or economic status, and regardless of their religion. When we don't, we are failing the marginalized as well as our great-great-grandchildren. Maybe our great-great-great-great-grandchildren who will grow up in the world that we are making today. See, it's human nature to want to tell the stories of who we are and where we came from. One of my favorite things to do is to tell Katie the story of of that time when she just couldn't wait to be part of her family and she decided that she was coming right now whether we were ready or not. It's human nature to want to tell the stories of what came before us and, and what has made us into the people that we are today. That's what Israel did during the Babylonian exile. They recorded the story of a God who spoke and all the good things of creation came into being. That story has been handed down from generation to generation. But today it's difficult for us to tell how we're different from those ancient Babylonians. We militarize the people who are meant to serve and protect us. We set our national guard against peaceful protesters. We debate the historical value of monuments to slavery that should have been melted down and turned into scrap metal 150 years ago. We silently lament the black lives lost but spring into action and board up an entire downtown because some windows might be broken? And this is what's going to be recorded of us. This is the narrative that we are leaving for those who come after us. These are the stories of their origin. That we were entrusted with the world, and that we put the safety of our stuff ahead of human lives. 
that our scripture commands the love of neighbor, but we allow our Bible to be used as a prop and a weapon. And please do not misunderstand me. When I say we, I mean myself as well. When I say us, I mean any of us. Any of us who have been content to sit back in the comfort of our privilege while our black siblings, our brown siblings, our indigenous siblings, our queer and trans siblings, our siblings with disabilities have had to struggle to live in freedom, safety, and comfort as God intended and created them to live. Today, we have the opportunity to rewrite our story. We can use the privilege we've been born with to speak out for the voiceless, to demand justice for the oppressed. Jesus lived his life doing just that. And it is time for us to get back into step with him. Out of the goodness, the incredible goodness of God's love, all things came into being. Out of the chaos, God spoke, and all things were created. God declared that the light and the darkness, the land and sky, the plants and animals and human beings, all of those things were good. The chaos is here again, my friends. The chaos is here again. And in the midst of this chaos, it is our turn to speak, to declare the goodness and worth of our black siblings, to stand up for a justice that is long overdue. That is the story I want them to tell about us. That is the legacy that we can leave. That is how we will bear God's image into the world and for those future generations. Let us go and speak and create out of this chaos, love, and a changed world. Amen.
Let us pray. God of love and justice, may your gifts of love transform and enliven us that we may live lives of thanksgiving. May your presence among us provoke such longing for your realm that we will never be satisfied until the whole earth knows your justice, your peace, and your love. Receive the blessing in the name of the Creator and Christ and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.